Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last lecture of EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing, we introduced the idea of phasers, which are complex numbers that encapsulate the amplitudes and phases of sinusoids. In this lecture on phaser addition, we'll see how phasers let us add sinusoids if the sinusoids have the same frequencies. So here's a couple of sinusoids. They have different amplitudes and different phases, but they have the same frequency. And if we add them up, something interesting happens. We get another sinusoid of the same frequency, but with an amplitude and a phase that will depend on the amplitudes and phases of the component sinusoids. Here's an example. Suppose we have these two sinusoids. They both have a frequency of 10 hertz. They have slightly different amplitudes, but very different phases. Here, we represent the phases in terms of some multiple of pi, as we like to do, and we're representing it in terms of over 180, so we can interpret the 70 here in units of degrees and the 200 here in units of degrees. And I will confess that this particular phase violates our usual convention of wanting to keep phases between minus pi and pi. We might do something like this on a test just to keep you on your toes. In this particular case, when you add these sinusoids, you get a sinusoid with the same frequency of 10 hertz, as we've discussed, but the amplitude is actually less than the amplitudes of either of the original sinusoids. There are other combinations of phases that might give you an amplitude that was somewhere in between or an amplitude that was bigger than both. So it's easy enough to figure out what the frequency is going to be. The point of this lecture is how to take the amplitudes and the phases of the original sinusoids to come up with the amplitude and the phase of the resulting sum. We can do this using the phasor addition rule. So for each of our sinusoids, we figure out what the phasor is. So the phasor for our sinusoid is a complex number where the amplitude of the sinusoid is the magnitude of the phasor, and the phase of the sinusoid is the angle of the phasor. Then all we need to do is add up the phasors. The magnitude of the resulting phasor sum is the amplitude of the sum of the sinusoids, and the angle of the resulting phasor sum is the phase of the sum of the sinusoids. This isn't hard to prove. You can take the original real-valued sinusoids and write them in terms of the real part, as we talked about in the last lecture. We can pull the sum inside the operation of taking the real part. So take this exponential of a sum and split it up into a product of two individual exponentials. Notice that this e to the j omega naught t doesn't have any k's in it, so I can factor that out of the sum. And then this is just a sum of a bunch of complex numbers. So that's our phasor addition operation. And then taking the real part of that gives us our resulting sinusoid. Let's think about this graphically. Here we have two arrows in black representing the individual phasors of the individual sinusoids. This is essentially where things would start at time equals zero. And we can think about the cosine as the projection of these vectors onto the horizontal axis. To get the sum of the phasors, we can think about making a head to tail kind of diagram, like in physics. So we can imagine for the first sinusoid that once we add in this e to the j omega t and let t start to march along, that starts to rotate around. That gives us our original sinusoid. And if we think about our second sinusoid, once we include the e to the j omega t, then that starts to march around. And because the omegas are the same, they're going to rotate with the same speed, so they're going to stay in lockstep with each other. So the phasor of the sum rotates with the same speed and maintains a consistent amplitude. Sorry, the circle and the center point here are wobbling about a bit. I ran out of patience trying to fix that PowerPoint animation. Let's say you didn't start with equations. Let's say you were given some graphs. 
In one of the previous lectures, we saw how to determine what the equation was from a graph. So in this case, notice that all of our sinusoids, both our original x1 and x2, and our resulting sum have a period of 0.1 that corresponds to our frequency of 10 hertz. Now, you would probably have to eyeball this very carefully to realize that this is 1.7, and eyeball this very carefully to realize this is 1.9, but you could at least get something in the ballpark. So those are the amplitudes. To figure out the phases, we need to figure out where some peaks are. In the first example, we're picking the peak that's closest to the origin as usual. Now, in the second example, we're breaking from convention a little bit. Usually, we want to pick the peak that's closest to the origin, which would be this one. But in this particular example, we're going to choose this one because it matches the equation that we showed earlier. Remember, you could always add or subtract multiples of 2 pi from your phases and technically get an equivalent expression. It's just a matter of convention. So for x1, we have a peak at minus 0 0.0194. And for the second sinusoid, we have a peak at minus 0 0.0556. So we need to convert these to phases. The frequency of our wave in radians per second is going to be 2 pi divided by the period. That's 20 pi radians per second. And we can use the formula of phi equals minus omega multiplied by the time of the peak. Now, if you were to take this and this and plug it into your calculator, it's not obvious that you get this initially. Typically, you wind up with some number phi in your calculator, and then you divide that by pi. So you can write phi as a multiple of pi. Then you might take that and try to multiply it by 180 to see what that looks like in degrees. And maybe then you'll notice that's a number that's close to 70. Of course, this was a contrived example. In real life, there's nothing that says that your angles need to work out to be multiples of 10 degrees or something like that. And although we'll usually write phases in terms of some multiples of pi, we quite often won't bother to try to put it into some kind of form of degrees like this. We'll just write point blah 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 times pi. So that was phi 1. You can run through the same kind of computation for phi 2 with all the same commentary. And as I mentioned before, we're breaking convention a little bit writing it like this. Usually we add or subtract multiples of 2 pi to get this within a range of minus pi to pi. And recalling our amplitudes, we have our complete cosines. So for the first cosine, we can write down the appropriate phasor representation. And again, this phasor alone is not the complete sinusoid. You would need to multiply this by e to the j 20 pi t, and then take the real part to actually get this expression exactly. But we'll take this representation in terms of this phasor and convert it from polar form to rectangular form. And then we do the same thing for the second sinusoid. And once we have it in rectangular form, we can add these phasors in rectangular form easily by just adding the real parts and adding the imaginary parts. Of course, we need to take that and turn that back into polar form to get a convenient form for the resulting phasor. But once we have that, we can easily read off what the cosine looks like. The magnitude of the phasor sum is the amplitude of my cosine, and the angle of my phasor sum is the phase of the resulting cosine. Of course, if you have a sufficiently fancy calculator or are using MATLAB, you can just ask it to add this and this and be done and not have to manually go through all of the steps of converting it to rectangular and back to polar. So let's think about this graphically. Here's the phasor for x1, and I can think about adding the phasor for x2 in terms of a head-to-tail diagram like in physics that gives me the resulting vector for my sum x3. And here you can see that pedagogically, it feels a little more natural to break our convention and write this as 200 pi divided by 180 
because you can see that the resulting phase angle is somewhere between this angle and this angle going this direction. So it's a little more natural to visualize 280 degrees going this way than minus 160 going this way in this particular example, but your mileage may vary. So phasor addition gave us the phase of the resulting sinusoid summation. To make the plot, we need to figure out what peak that might correspond to. So here we invert the formula we used earlier and write minus my phase phi, but we're going to divide it now by the frequency omega in radians per second, which gives us a peak that's located here. Our amplitude is around 1.5, which is around here. Let's do a more computationally pleasant example. I could write the cosine for x1 in terms of the real part of this expression. And here the phasor is pretty simple. This just has an amplitude of one and it has a phase of zero. For the second one, I have an amplitude of square root of three and a phase of 0.5 pi. So when I think about adding these things together, this is particularly nice because the phasor for x1 is purely real and the phasor for x2 is purely imaginary when we realize that e to the j pi over 2, well, that's just j. So thinking about converting this into polar coordinates, I have a real part of 1, an imaginary part that's square root of 3. I don't know why the equation is showing up strangely here. My colleagues made these slides a million years ago, and my version of Microsoft PowerPoint refuses to open them. So I can't fix anything without actually redoing the equation from scratch, and I'm feeling too lazy to do that, sorry. Anyway, if I think about this triangle here, this is my classic 30, 60, 90 right triangle. So the angle here corresponds to 60 degrees, or pi over 3 radians, and my length here is 2. So in the cosine form, I just have an amplitude of 2, and a phase of pi over 3, and I have my original frequency of 77 pi. Let me tell you a little bit about how we might disguise a problem like this on an exam. Remember that if I add or subtract pi inside of a cosine, that's equivalent to sticking a minus sign out here in front. So, I could subtract pi from 0.5 pi and get minus 0.5 pi and put this minus sign here. But then I look at this and remember that by our usual trig identities, this is equivalent to sine 77 pi t. So instead of giving the problem as originally shown, we might give you something like minus square root of 3 sine 77 pi t, in which case you should first turn this sine into a cosine, and get rid of this minus by adding or subtracting pi inside of the cosine to get everything in a consistent form, and then move on with the rest of the problem. Let's say you wanted to add up these 20 sinusoids. Well, that would be a real pain. For something like that, you might want to ask MATLAB. So the phasors are going to have square root of k for their magnitude, and for the angles, we'll have the frequency of 120 pi times these time shifts. So those are given here. And now it's just a matter of how you would write this in MATLAB. So if you haven't used MATLAB before, this 1 colon 20 notation will create a vector 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 20. When you want to multiply things element-wise, instead of doing a matrix multiplication, you put a period in front of the star for the multiplication. The rest of this should be fairly self-explanatory. Sum then sums up everything in the vector. MATLAB is nice because it will handle the whole vector at once. And then in the DSP First toolbox, there is a special routine called zprint that will printy print the complex number, or you could just say xx to give the number back in a non-pretty way. The non-pretty way will just be the rectangular form, but zprint, it will give you the rectangular form, and then it will also give it to you in polar form 
with a phase three different ways. Phase in radians, the phase in radians divided by pi, so you can think of it as this number times pi, and the phase in degrees.